Put in Head Wilson by Mark Twain. Book review. So this is one of Mark Twain's lesser known works, or actually it's not that lesser known, it's semi lesser known works. I think it's still fairly well known. Um, anyways, Mark Twain is one of those authors you can never go wrong with. So I checked it out of the library and I was not disappointed. The plot is a little bit difficult to summarize, partly because, uh, as Mark Twain admits in the author's foreword, this is a combination of different stories. And partly because most of the action takes place in the fifth act. Uh, the rest of the book is just kind of characters positioning themselves uh, so that when the fifth act comes, everything falls into place. So rather than try and describe the plot, I think it's easier to just introduce the main characters instead. So first is Dave Wilson. He's the smartest person in the town, and he's a great wit. Unfortunately, no one else in the town understands irony. So he, Wilson is making all these ironic remarks, and everyone else is taking them at face value. I, irony here in the sense of sarcasm. So the town people conclude that actually he's a complete idiot, and they give him the nickname Puddin' Head Wilson. Pudding Head. Yeah. Then there are two babies switched at birth. One, Tom Driscoll, is the legitimate son and heir to the estate fortune. The other baby, Chambers, is 1 32nd black. So he's 31 30 seconds white, but he's 1 32nd black. And this book takes place in the South in a slave state uh, under slave law. And they actually had a law that if you were 1 32nd black, you were black. That, that, I mean, that's how much it was. But nobody notices that the mo when the mother switches these two babies at birth and thus reverses the fortune of each. And finally, there are two twin Italian nobles who rent out a room in the town and become the fascination and the darlings of this sleepy southern town. And then all of these elements come together and there's a murder mystery thrown in during the fifth act. Uh, also lots of funny stuff and Twain's usual biting social commentary. Now the book jacket, uh, I'm going to borrow the commentary from the book jacket here. The book jacket had an interesting quote. It said, <clears throat> Twain's ruminations on the issues of the day make this novel a perpetual question and one of the author's most ironic and elusive. What does that mean? Well, I, I took it to mean we know he's criticizing something. We just don't know what. Now, some of the things that Twain is criticizing are obvious. For, for example, the obvious thing that he's having fun with is this old Southern law that if you were 1 32nd black, that was enough to make you a slave. Now, in reality, if you've got one thirty-second black blood in you, nobody could actually know. So when the mother switches these two babies at birth, one of them is just one thirty-second black and the other is white, but nobody could tell the difference. So she's able to get away with the switch. Um, in this way, Twain seems to be hinting that race is not actually about the blood. It's about a physical, sorry, it's about a social construct uh, because they, you know, they, you can't physically tell the difference between these two babies, but one supposedly uh, is supposed to be born a slave and one supposedly is supposed to be born the slave owner. Um, I think Twain is ahead of his time in this, uh, although I don't know what was his time like. Maybe other people had the same idea. Another theme that's fairly easy to realize is uh, put in Head Wilson. You know, the poor guy, he's smarter than anybody else in the town, but because he's smarter than them, uh, none of them are on the same level and they think he's an idiot. So, the, you know, the fate of genius is to be mocked by people who can't understand it. Um, as to the rest of the themes, I'll just leave them for somebody more perceptive than me to tease out. 
Now the story. Uh, the actual story, I found the ending was a bit anticlimactic and predictable. Although the real beauty of this book is not so much the ending, it's just kind of the humor mixed in along the way. For example, each chapter opens with an ironic quote from Puddinghead Wilson's calendar. And these are the type of biting one-liners that Mark Twain is so famous for. My personal favorite was, Adam was but human. This explains it all. He did not want the apple for the apple's sake. He wanted it only because it was forbidden. The mistake was in not forbidding the serpent. Then he would have eaten the serpent. Um, <clears throat> side note, you know, I know Mark Twain didn't believe in the Bible, but for somebody who didn't believe in the Bible, he sure quoted it a lot or referenced it. I think back in those days, biblical literacy was just much more assumed. Everyone grew up, grew up knowing the Bible, whether you were Christian or not. So, for example, if you don't know the story in the Old Testament about Elisha and the 42 ewes and the bears, you're going to miss out on a great one-liner. Uh, so, fair warning. Yeah, all in all, I'd, I'd recommend this book.